Hey guys, Zach here. So today we're gonna try something a little different. We're gonna switch up the format and answer some of the great feedback we received from our Wind Up Bird Chronicle video, Confronting the Self. So if you like what we're doing, let us know in the comments section. And if you want us to go back to the old format, well, we plan on it. So without further ado, sit back and enjoy this edition of Lit Tips. So right off the bat, I want to say I apologize if I mispronounce your name. But here's a great comment from Eric Arizala. He says, I just finished the book and I feel completely blown away. The scenes that Murakami portrays are scenes I have never witnessed or experienced in any other art form. It feels like I have discovered a completely different color when reading The Wind-Up Bird. A color that is impossible to describe to a person that hasn't read the book. I feel empty and sad, the same way you feel when waking up from a beautiful dream that you know that you will never be able to experience again. Great commentary, by the way. Thanks, Eric. So, let's dig into this. Thanks for the kind feedback, Eric. The feeling you described is what makes Marikami's novels so fascinating and immersive. He explores themes and examines the subconscious to better understand our sense of self and place in the world. The narrators often face their own version of chaos, and they must navigate their way out, sometimes through metaphysical occurrences that are best represented in dreams and meditation. When I finished the novel, I had a renewed outlook on my own life. It made me want to confront my own traumas, and I believe that's the power of Marikami and his writing. Christina Tescon says, What about Mei Kasuhara? You made no mention of this major character. Yeah, unfortunately we didn't have time to explore Mei, and uh, again, I would love to just cover a whole video on its own of Mei Kasuhara because she is such an enigmatic, uh, fully formed character that I think deserves more. But uh, in the meantime, let's take a closer look right now. While venturing out to search for their cat, Noboru Wataya, Toru ends up in an alley behind an abandoned house, which has a dark history of grave misfortunes that involve both hardship and death. Also located nearby is the house of Mei Kasahara, a teenager who isn't in school because of her injuries in a recent motorcycle accident. She is only faking her limp to remain out of school. Mei is sunbathing when Toru first meets her and has a lively personality. However, as the narrative unravels, we find out there's more to the accident she was involved in. And together, both Toru and Mei contend with their own traumas that thrust them into chaos. Together, they both form an odd friendship. Mei Kasahara is pivotal to Toru and his journey to find Komiko. When Mei closes the well and traps Toru inside, it forces him to confront what lies in his subconscious to reach Komiko. Mei too struggles with confronting her own subconscious and guilt. She used to prank her motorcyclist boyfriend by intermittently covering his eyes while they rode together. However, what began as an innocent prank led to the accident and her boyfriend's subsequent death. She struggles to make sense of herself, the state of existence, and the unexplained which isn't so easily put into words. Here's an exchange between Mei Kasuhara and Toru that speaks to her state of mind. Here's what I think, Mr. Wind-Up Bird, said Mei Kasuhara. Everybody's born with some different thing at the core of their existence, and that thing, whatever it is, becomes like a heat source that runs each person from the inside. I have one too, of course, like everybody else, but sometimes it gets out of hand. It swells or shrinks inside me and it shakes me up. What I'd really like to do is find a way to communicate that feeling to another person, but I can't seem to do it. They just don't get it. Of course, the problem could be that I'm not explaining it very well. They pretend to be listening, but they're not really. So I get worked up sometimes, and I do some crazy things. Crazy things? Like, say, trapping you in a well, or like, when I'm riding on the back of a motorcycle, putting my hands over the eyes of the guy who's driving. Msin93 says, Great video. My take wasn't that Malta and Krita were being narratively replaced by Nutmeg and Cinnamon. I believe Krita and Malta are parallels to Kumiko 
and her dead older sister, not Nutmeg, in Cinnamon. Even without the direct reference to the physical resemblance, I felt Krita was a lens for us to see another side of Komiko, as both suffered under Noboru. Malta also becomes absent in Krita's life when she needs her, similar to Komiko, dealing with her sister's death. This is enlightening commentary from Msin93, and I didn't initially consider the parallel between Malta and Krita, and Komiko and her sister. Krita loses herself altogether after her encounter with Noboru, where she is defiled, and unable to reach her big sister, she was left empty. While explaining how she felt to Toru, she says, I needed time to get used to my new self. What kind of a being was this self of mine? How did it function? What did it feel and how? I had to grasp each of these things through experience, to memorize and stockpile them. Do you see what I am saying? Virtually everything inside me had spilled out and been lost. At the same time that I was entirely new, I was almost entirely empty. I had to fill in that blank, little by little, one by one with my own hands. I had to make this thing I called I, or rather make the things that constituted me. Jorge Salgado writes, Thanks for this amazing interpretation of the book. What do you think about Lieutenant Maimaya? I think is a parallel of Okada. Both suffering in the well, finally Okada was able to overcome his suffering, and water came out from the well. He accepted Komiko's destiny and is willing to wait for her. Komiko's prison is herself, paying for her crime, killing her brother intentionally, having sex with a lot of men, killing in the process of her husband. And Toru Okada knows her sentence will not be much because her crime was not with real intention and is willing to wait for her, Komiko, to forgive herself. Again, great review of the book and sorry for my English but not much analysis of this book online in Spanish. Greetings from Chile. Hi Jorge, thanks for your analysis. I'm happy to hear our audience has expanded all the way to Chile. I agree with your thoughts on Toru and Lieutenant Mamaya. Julia Knox covered this area pretty well, suggesting that Mamaya provides a historical context for the identity struggles of Toru, who is unable to grapple with Japanese norms and ideologies of success and power. Mamaya's world split back when he was a part of the Kwantung army, and watched as another man was skinned alive by Boris the Skinner, then became trapped within a well just like Toru, and beheld a light. Especially after he returns to Japan, he's never the same. However, at the narrative's conclusion, Mamaya and Krita wed, and they have a child named Corsica. So if Mamaya and Krita work as a parallel to Toru and Kumiko, then it's satisfying to read how they ultimately find happiness. What about the story of the boy looking out of his window in the middle of the night watching one man climbing a tree and another digging a hole? I didn't understand who that boy was and what the story signified. So let's unpack this a little bit. The titular wind-up bird is a harbinger of something bad that's to transpire. For example, when Cinnamon hears the bird, it ends with him losing the power of speech. This is the result of an out-of-body experience. As his conscience splits, he's gifted with healing metaphysical abilities and able to communicate perfectly well without the use of speech. With this in mind, let's highlight what Carla Van Grove covered in her essay, The Cinnamon Chronicle. Where and when did Cinnamon gain this deep understanding of the labyrinth connected to the physical world and its flow? When this occurs, it's never flat out mentioned in the Wind Up Bird Chronicle, but a specific time is highly implied. In Book 3, a new viewpoint is introduced of a dreaming child. In the boy's dream, he watches two men bury something under a tree, and then the man who looks most like his father climbs the tree never to be seen again. In the second dream he has, the boy tells himself that the first dream had not really been a dream, but that this second encounter is truly a dream. Convinced of this dream, he goes out to the tree in his yard and digs up what the men had buried. He uncovers a human heart. Startled, he retreats back to his bed to await the coming of morning, only to find that his body is already in bed. This second dreamlike encounter for the boy is not a dream, but rather an excursion into the spiritual world. 
specifically Cinnamon's first excursion beyond the thin line separating the physical and spiritual worlds. His discovery of the human heart under the tree is a prelude to his father's strange murder sometime later during which his heart was stolen. Cinnamon finds the heart under the tree in the spiritual world because his father is on a path that leads him to his murder. When Cinnamon panicked in that world and tried to return to his bed in the real world, he found his physical self which had never entered the spiritual world. The next comment is from Lucas Schatz. Nice essay. I wonder if you have any idea who the Hollow Man is. Because from all the characters, I remember he seems to be the most mysterious of them all. To put it briefly, the Hollow Man is Cinnamon. Again, Carla Vangrove does a nice job of stringing the pieces together. Carla writes, The computer is part of Cinnamon, and the fact that there is data hidden there that no one can access but Cinnamon himself tells Toru that there is far more to Cinnamon than meets the eye. Again, the connection that Cinnamon has with the labyrinth and flow between worlds is revealed through Toru's observations when he notes that he couldn't help but feel that reality resides for Cinnamon not so much in the earthly world, but in the subterranean labyrinth. Perhaps in that world, Cinnamon has a clear ringing voice, with which he speaks eloquently and laughs and cries aloud. It is in this world that Cinnamon watches the flow of happenings in the universe. He heals his mother's spiritual injuries, and because of this world, he does not require healing. His mother mentions that Cinnamon understands things in a special way, watching the flow of the worlds and seeing the potential outcome from every flow. A deeper part of Cinnamon's connection to the flow of both worlds is shown through the doings of a character in the hotel at the bottom of the well. When Toru enters this hotel, which is an embodiment of the spiritual world, it is in his dreams. This world is shown to be more than a mere dream at the novel's end, when the wounds Toru received in the room 108 carry into the waking world and Noboru Wataya collapses for seemingly no reason. The second time that Toru enters this world, he comes across a man with no face. Though it is never stated by Marikami, this faceless man, who later is known as the Hollow Man, is Cinnamon in the spiritual world embodied by the hotel. This is the Cinnamon that Toru said may exist in a different world, where he could laugh, cry, and speak in a beautiful voice. Encounters with this mysterious character reveal him to be in tune with the inner workings of events in the same way that Cinnamon is. YX Vogel 22 writes, I enjoyed this video. It's difficult to do a 12 minute video about a book like The Wind Up Bird Chronicle with all the multiple themes running through it. I recently read it for the second time and I found so much more in it. One theme I found was of lost connections. Toru seems to lose connections throughout the novel. His cat goes missing, then his wife goes missing, his connection with Mei Kasahara seems tenuous, she's not always in her backyard when he's looking for her. His connection with the Kano sisters is incomplete because he can't call them. He needs to wait for them to contact him. Even Nutmeg and Cinnamon aren't totally there with him. They buy him the house with the well, but Cinnamon can't talk, and Cinnamon's computer won't give him all the information he needs or wants. I think a good symbol from the book is what Mr. Okada left for Toru, an empty box. Of course, the overriding symbol is the well, where Toru spends time in isolation and is nearly left for dead until Mei Kasahara saves him. But she really was not a decent savior, since she almost didn't drop the ladder to let him get out. And all possible connections at the end of the novel don't happen. Toru's wife writes to him, but she kills her brother and wants to be executed. Nutmeg and Cinnamon disappear and sell the house with the well. He meets with Mei Kasahara again at the end, but all the letters she sent to him he never received, and it seems that they may never meet again. The only lasting connection seems to be that Toru's cat is still with him. Thanks for sharing, YX Vogel 22 I actually thought much of the same way when I first read the book, and, and actually after the second time. But the cat itself represents hope. And I believe this loss of connection and sense of nothingness is paramount to Toru's, and thereby Komiko's by association, both their ultimate growth. It is when Toru loses such connections that he's forced to look within, into the spiritual world, 
By doing so, Toru receives spiritual powers and healing abilities. We are surrounded by spiritual depths, and without loss and friction, there's no way to know that they're there. So even though Toru loses multiple connections, there is still a thread that holds them all together. And that's their shared experience of trauma. Thanks for all the feedback, and apologies if we didn't get to your question, but the video is starting to run long, so we had to cut it short. If you like this format, let us know in the comments section and we can try it again in the future. We hope you enjoyed this edition of Lit Tips. As always, hit that like button if you like what we're doing. Subscribe for more videos on your favorites to the Plan Obscure, hit that bell if you want to be notified when videos drop, and leave a comment with your thoughts on this video and suggestions for books and authors in future episodes. Until next time, keep reading.